Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Starting with uh, looking at the theme of this conference, meeting reality, for me being military, being responsible for capability development, uh, you can imagine we meet the reality every day when it comes to capabilities. And I guess you all can agree with me on one fact. Having a lot of good capabilities on PowerPoint slides, explaining you what could happen is nice, but will not do the job. And this is what we are after, especially when it comes to LA command transformation. My command, I'm quite often asked, what are you doing? Okay, we are one of the two strategic commands within NATO, sitting in Norfolk, but we have three main tasks. And very briefly, one is warfare development. So we are looking out from a seven year point because SHAPE is doing the near term stuff, taking care of the operations. So looking out to the seven years and we look seven to 19 years in capability development and all the planning. And of course, a lot beyond the 19 years, looking out to 20, 30, 40 years beyond what's the future might hold for us and coming back to again, and there you will hear that quite often from me, capabilities, capability, capabilities, because this is how you meet uh, and do the job at the end of the day. So with that, warfare development, we have two uh, other tasks we are following is capability development with nations. Okay, so we set the frame and uh, in order to develop them. And uh, another task we have is common funded development. So about 95% of the capabilities provided to NATO are provided by nations and 5% about common funded. Common funded is more in the C2, C3, C3 structure. So a lot of command and control, uh, we call it over and above. And this is also where, and I will touch on that, maybe cyber on a common funded idea might uh, lead into the future uh, as well. So having that, and with the task we are having, I just would like to give you a bit of an insight <clears throat> from a defense planner's point of view and the defense planning community I represent. So what are really the challenges right now we have in capability development when we look into the future? And if you look at it, uh, what has been done and what's a challenge for us is if you look at the past 20 years, most of the nation, NATO nations have focused on two things, nation building and asymmetric threat. And I mean, you can have it in your papers, whatever you want. At the end of the day, this is really where capability development went within nations over time. At the same time in the past 20 years, our peer competitors, if you will, Russia and China, they went an opposite way. And if you look at it, how they developed, and I just look at UAVs, look at hypersonic, all those threats. So they really lose, used the 20 years to fill the gap. They are not there yet. That's good, but they caught up with us uh, in, in order to do that. And with that as well, they used it an advantage, I would say in the past where we looked at the 360 degree uh, uh, development of capabilities. And uh, then they developed some core capabilities, really in area denial uh, capabilities against us. And if you do analysis on that one, you could say China really has risen to a kind of powerhouse when it comes to uh, military capabilities. And Russia, and don't be mistaken if just looking at the Ukraine, okay? Because there is more than you see, the, the Navy, the Air Force, strategic, nuclear, space. There are a lot of capabilities out there. So they have niche capabilities we really have to uh, look at. And uh, as I always say, don't as, uh, underestimate them, okay? And just to add up one more thing, the 2%. Okay, because most of our nations did not uh, spend the 2% as they agreed to. And this is overall a strategic dilemma we brought ourselves into when I look from a defense planner's point of view to capabilities. If you look at the 2022 report from uh, NATO, now Secretary General just published it. Right now we have in 2022 seven nations who meet the 2%. And that's it. So, and there's a bit more to it and I get to that in a, in a second as well. So what has changed over time is as well, again, from a defense planner's point of view, we went into a global power competition with Russia and with China. And not only that, we are now in an area of disruption. And not only that, look at Africa, look at the Arabian Peninsula. There are so many threats out there and look at all the unsolved conflicts we're having just look at Libya, look at Syria, and we have no real answer to that. Coming back to what our job is back in Norfolk, what capabilities are do we plan against it in order to really be able for NATO in, uh, as a standing and strong alliance, really coping with all the threats we are having out there. At the same time, what has not changed, of course, it's the, well, the, uh, all the need for ag agility and speed in order to develop certain things. And again, and we will hear that, I guess, throughout the today as well, harmonization, standardization, and interoperability in order to really move forward as an alliance in order to do that. And this is something my headquarter also looks after. So 
with, if this is the frame, <coughs> what is the long-term military transformation from a strategic headquarters, uh, headquarters point of view? Uh, number one, what really has changed in a very good, dramatic good way is, is the strategic concept. Okay? If you look at Madrid, now we really refocused and we have three main tasks we follow as well, deterrence and defense, with a clear focus on deterrence. We heard yesterday about escalation dynamics, all those issues, so deterrence is really something we have to look after and we have to get a lot smarter about it. Then of course crisis uh, management, crisis response, and cooperative security through partnership. Those are the three main tasks we are following also when we go into capability development. This is what we do over time. So right now, <clears throat> this is where the defense planning process goes into when we come into how we uh, then structure our capabilities with the new political guidance and follow on. And I will explain that in a little bit, how we take forward, what are the capabilities we are looking for and where are we going. And what I said before, ladies and gentlemen, what's very important are the three C's for NATO. It's cash, the 2%. Then it's the capabilities and it's the contribution, because one doesn't go without the other. And this is really what you have to look, especially, and this is what you also discuss, if you want to be a MDO-enabled alliance, multi-domain operations through digital transformation. And I heard yesterday um, some discussions, just let me also stress one point. What we as NATO, what we as military, what we as alliance are after is, MDO means... <coughs> If you go with the five domains we are having, air, land, sea, cyber, and space, this is joint, okay? You might go joint plus. MDO is a bit more, but what we are after is that we really orchestrate our domains and synchronize with the rest of the domains on the non-military side. By far, there's no idea of command control, anything beyond the five military domains we are looking at. So what we are really after is getting the full picture, getting a full synchronization, having a better picture, and acting better and getting better effects. I just would like to stress that one more time, uh, what we are after on that. Let me make a few more remarks as well on, as I said, strategic concept. What's also remarkable when I look towards the US, and you might, those of you who have read those papers, we are very much aligned now with the national defense strategy, and we are also very much aligned with the strategic compass from EU. So this is also something you see in a common way forward with all the major alliances uh, in order to really go forward and look at capabilities as we develop them. Capabilities, why? Because a lot of times I'm hearing game-changing, game-changing, game-changing. Well, I tell you from my point of view and from a capability point of view, what's a game-changer? A game-changer is if your opponent has to rethink, has to come up with new ideas and has to come up with new technology. Most of the things we see out there, we hear a lot of times it's game-changing. I tell you it's not, okay? What's game-changing might be in the the years back, something on nuclear, submarines, all those things. But a new aircraft carrier, a new fifth gen aircraft is not a game changer, okay? And hypersonics by far is not a game changer. Just if you see, if you look from a capability perspective, but we have to think about it when we talk about how do we develop capabilities overall, it's the same when you go into cyber domain, okay? So with that, my command as well. We do a lot of innovation, EDTs and all those things. This is where we look to gain advantage again and really think about what could be game changing in the future and how we take that forward. Because again, it's all about capabilities. And capabilities, ladies and gentlemen, don't be mistaken. It's not just a weapon system. You had yesterday already discussions. Just look at personnel. Look at the structure you have. Look at the organization that had. This all comes together. And now, from a capability manager's point of view with NATO, we think and we work for 31 nations. Now, if you know what capability development means within one nation, think about what it means for really aligning 31 nations in order to get forward and get that done. And this is the job we are after uh, and uh, what we are uh, looking uh, overall in order to get forward. And at the end of the day, every nation has the same problem, limited resources. So with that, how do we do it in practical terms? What are we planning with the LA Command transformation if it comes to capability development overall? I said, and uh, you all know that, of course, conceptual documents, uh, st strategies are very, very important, and you need to have them in order to frame where you're going. By the end of the day, it's, it's really the capability that comes with it and what you do with that. And this is what we are after. And I don't want to really get into details and... Uh, 
I'm not boring you, but it's not my intent to uh, elaborate on the, uh, the documents we're having there. What I would like to do is just from the World uh, Fair Development Agenda, the frame we are having, how we are going to the future, we have five imperatives. And those five imperatives, they lead us in the way forward how we do capability development and also when it comes to cyber. So number one is cognitive superiority. You all discussed it, but this is really how you prepare, how you prepare your leadership, how you prepare the citizen. So it's, it's really um, a hall of state, if you will, uh, uh, way forward in what you did. And I think Ukraine is a very good example if you see what cognitive superiority does for a society in order to really to stand up against the threat you have versus if you have people that they don't know what they fight for. So there you can already see how important cognitive superiority comes down to when it comes to conflict. The other thing, of course, is resilience. Okay. Resilience, uh, quite often discussed, resilience, and uh, I can tell you from the heart of a military uh, person, okay, it's very much what you do with the civil side of the world. Uh, what uh, the, I said before, one domain we are having is space. Yeah. We would be insane if we would like to try to put up space capabilities what's, uh, or duplicate what's already up there. So the way forward is, you know, go in deep coordination with the civil side, use the infrastructure you have in space, use the services you have, just make sure you have assured access and it's a data security. Those are the things we are after. So this is very much about resilience and uh, what we need to look at there. Then of course, how do you influence? How do you project your power? That's another imperative. And of course, two classic ones, it's multi-domain defense, operations, if you will, and cross-domain command and control, where again, cyber comes in again. So those five imperatives, they really lead us by all the capability development we are doing from a military strategic headquarters point of view on the way forward. So having said that, how it's done in practical terms? How do we do that with nations? Because there is a process out there, it's the NATO planning process, okay? It has five steps. Step one is you have a political guidance. The political guidance is important, and now we are in a transformational era, if you will, because the level of ambition has changed. The level of ambition nowadays is, with the new era we are having, we have to be prepared on an Article 5, which means defense of the alliance as a whole, to pre be prepared to set all the capabilities you need in order to do that. And then, of course, there are asymmetric threats, and as I said, there are uh, also crisis response operations with that. So that gives you a complete set of tasks you're getting, which is the level of ambition. And from that, this is what we do, we then derive from their capability requirements with the nations and we set targets. We have 68 quanti qualitative targets and over 4,200 quantitative targets. This is how you apportion the nations because you have to imagine now you want to defend the alliance as a whole, okay? And now every nation can participate in that. And this is how we apportion and target nations with certain capabilities we see. And this is the develop. We develop them with them, of course, uh, because it never goes against the nations. And as uh, stressed and said before, we work for nations and not against the nations. So this is what we are doing. And let me stress one point here, because this is where operational planning meets defensive planning or defense planning. Because if you make the mistake, which is quite often made, is that you just look at what the operations hold for you today and you plan what we have today, you always prepare for the war of yesterday. And this is what's so important. This is, we have two strategic headquarters where shape comes in. They look at, as I said, to the zero to six, seven years. And those of you who know on procurement cycles, okay, today for the next seven, eight years, if you have your, the, the, the big things coming in, ships, airplanes, whatever, they, the decisions are made. You have no influence anymore. So this is what you really have to think about it. And this is where defense planning comes in. And there's quite a difference between operations planning and defense planning. And this is what you have to see. And this is where we come in and say, this is what the future holds for you. This is what we have to prepare for the future. So with that, we go forward on that one. Why? And this again, three easy things, if you will. Okay, what are we striving for with NATO, with the military alliance? Number one, you need to have an information dominance. All we do, all the capabilities we look at, all the concepts we're doing is achieving information dominance. Why? In order to get a decision dominance, and from the decision dominance, you can get an escalation dominance, be it 
uh, uh, lethal or non-lethal. So cyber is in there. And all the three things I just named have a very close connection to cyber all the times. Which brings me quickly at the end of my speech to cyber. And this is what you're all here for. Uh, number one is, as I said, we have five domains. But cyber is very much different from the rest of the domains, if you will, because it's not a classical military one. I would say the three classic ones, we more or less think we own it. Cyber, we definitely don't own it. So you have a lot of players in there. And this is what you have to understand in order if you want to go forward. The other thing is speed. Yesterday I had it's the speed of light. Well, I would say it's the speed of relevance. Decisions are different. Cycles are different. Procurement is different. You have to think about all those things, how you take that forward. And let me make also one very important point. Okay, we all know and we accept cyber capabilities are provided by the nations and the nations are, hold them very tight. But I give you one example, it's logistics, okay? Because at the same time, it was in NATO, we always said logistics is a national responsibility, you take care of it. And if you analyze Ukraine today, you see what logistics holds for you, what challenges are in there. And all I'm saying is, when we take cyber forward, be careful how you do that, because it comes back to harmonization, standardization, and interoperability at the end of the day. And if you don't take care of that from the beginning onward, you might have quite a problem when it comes to multi-domain uh, operations within cyber as an aspect to that. Awareness, it's another point, of course, if for NATO, what we are after is that we are a uh, uh, platform to coordinate and to collaborate, so the awareness is there. As much as positive things and uh, cyber holds for you and uh, on uh, the, the vulnerabilities you have and the, the threat you have out there, at the same time, it's a force multiplier. So we really think about that uh, and this is what our command uh, looks after in order to do that. So having said all those things, what we think very much about is the interconnection that requires a different approach in the future. This is what we also think about in order uh, thinking defense and reconnaissance. So a new way forward on that one. I said on development overall, so cyber holds and with AI, quantum computing, a lot of things are in there where we look with our people in there when it comes to new weather predictions, scenario predictions, uh, post-quantum encryption standards where we built in. So we have a lot of things. We working with our innovation branches with home, home with the cyber branches. And I just can invite all of you who have not talked to ACT about all those things because we have also two advantages. We have personnel and we have money to do that. Uh, not a lot of people have that. So if you're interested in that, please contact us uh, on a way forward. I said it before, common funded. I said it yesterday in one of the discussions. We have 31 nations. Not every nation is really always capable in uh, providing the full array or, or having the full capabilities. So this is something we are discussing as well, what might be options in order for the future to really provide capabilities to the alliance overall, uh, also from a cyber aspect, uh, and how we go into uh, common funded developments. With that, resilience, I talked in the beginning, really what we are after right now, and uh, to make it short, we working on concepts and the civil mill cooperation, really to have a full understanding and uh, requirements. Uh, what we are trying to do is an adoption of the full scope of cyber. And with that, a comprehensive plus approach. Comprehensive plus approach means it's not only a whole of government, whole of state. It's also key industry, everybody in there. Why? Because otherwise we will not be able to have, as I said in the beginning, the awareness. And again, you have a problem on duplications. Because this is what we see in, in, in Europe. If you look at it in, in Europe, how capability developments in the classic way are done, you know how many duplications are out there. Cyber being a pretty new domain in the development and everything we do, coming back to interoperability, what I said before, and what Chris will talk about it in a second as well, is this is really something we have to focus on in order not learning the lessons over and over again. So having that said, for us overall and coming back to multi-domain operations, what I led in before is really what we try to do is those five domains, 
under one of umbrella and really bringing it forward in order to create effects to the much better extent and meet the challenges of the future uh, as, as we have them uh, there. So really the question for us is how do we structure future operations? What do we expect in future missions? How do we prepare and plan for missions? How do we lead missions and how do we operate in the future? And also one interesting aspect we are discussing, I just would like to share it with you is of course command and control of the future. Within a multi-domain operation, the classic command control setup as we have it today with all the headquarters out there. Number one, the question is, are we, will be, are we able in the future to really man it in a way, to organize and orchestrate uh, operations in the future as we do it nowadays? I would say no. And this is something really we also have to rethink and you will see for NATO and the nations in itself, command and control setups, there will be quite a change in the future. This is what we foresee and this is what we work on as well with LA command transformation. To summarize it, well, I, I hope I could uh, just show you that uh, there is no doubt that we need to be more agile, more innovative, more efficient and more resilient in everything we do. And I can assure you, this is what Allied Command Transformation stands for, that's what we are doing. And this is my, my key message to you. It's not only one domain, it's not only cyber, it's five domains we are looking at. And this is really where you create the effects, where you have to go forward and uh, where you have to put all your eggs into the basket in order really to come forward. Strengthening the European pillar of NATO, I said, be careful that you don't duplicate, but strengthen it uh, in order to make the alliance stronger overall. And with all that, my command, this is what we preparing for, the advice we are giving and the military uh, advice we're giving to nations uh, in order to be able to uh, plan for all the requirements for future full spectrum operations. Having said that as well, uh, I would say the main task we are having, coming back to, again, it's military operations, we really make sure that what I said before, we are two strategic headquarters shaped, those are the ones who defend Europe from a strategic point of view, and we ensure with all the future work we are doing, with the defense planners work we are doing, we ensure really that shape is capable of not only fighting today, but also fighting tomorrow as well. And just one last comment, uh, and uh, you know that everything we do, we do in order to prepare when it comes to conflict, that we leave the battlefield as winners because there is no prize for second winner in the business we are in. With that, more than happy to take a few questions, and thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, please stand up, state your name and affiliation. Thank you. It's too early. There's a mic coming. If we're looking towards the future and transformation, the science tells us that Arctic sea ice is retreating. And that's not really a capability that NATO has anything to do with yet, but Russia does. Do we have any plans to transform to look towards the Arctic? Um, of course we do. So uh, you all know High North. Uh, it, it, it's quite, quite uh, of interest for us because from the defense planner's point of view, what we look at uh, when we look at the Arctic is something uh, if there are could be what are the possibilities for a conflict in the future. Okay, uh, I, I just give you a quicker insight on what happens if Ukraine would come, which we don't hope, would come to a stalemate and Russia would seek for new opportunities to cause problems. Where would they go? What would they do? So those are the questions we are asking ourselves. This is what we are preparing for. And this is where we think about future capabilities with the Nordic nations in order to see what could be done to prevent that. So there are a lot of thoughts about that one already. My name is Klaus Herdkern and I'm a uh outside advisor to Estonian-based Binalize that has uh, some of our NATO customers here in this room and I'm establishing trust. What will be your legacy uh, in terms of the continuity from General von Steuben, who helped George Washington be successful a few centuries ago? What will be your future legacy that you can say, yes, I helped do that, that fills your heart and inspires all of us in this room? 
<laughs> you know, I'm living right now. I'm living in Norfolk, so uh, very close to, to a lot of the sites for from the Civil War in the U.S. Um, the the problem if you in, in, if you ask Chris Padilla in person, you know, being to war zones and all the things, uh, in order to help, really, is that uh, we need to come to a from a NATO perspective, what we need to project is security. And uh, because I've been to Afghanistan, I've seen that. And, and talking about my personal experience and talking about German ideas of exporting democracy, hmm, uh, it's really building a foundation with NATO, building a foundation to really export security. And if we can do that, that would be it's not that ambitious, I know, but it would help. And I think it would be viewed as a more honest broker in the world. Because as I said before, I just came back from Iraq. If you look at what the security situation again is in Iraq, uh, if you look at the African continent, there are so many uh, potential conflicts and uh, developing conflicts out there. Uh, and uh, if you just think we go somewhere, do it and come back and have our mission is, is fulfilled, look at Afghanistan, what we have done. So for me, what, what I am after is really continuity. Continuity in establishing security and providing security to those who are willing to accept that. Of course, you always need to do that, but this is something I'm after. With that, I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, General Padilla.